Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, and welcome to First Central as we gather for worship this morning. In Psalm 95, the uh, psalmist says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. We have the opportunity this morning to sing his praise, to declare his glory, because the God we serve is far and away above any other supposed rival, any other alternative. And so thanks for joining us this morning for a great time of thanksgiving. I would also invite you to join us Thursday morning at 7 a.m. at the backside of Zot Park for our annual Thanksgiving bonfire and praise service. Uh, we, as a church, I haven't been there for all of them, but we've been doing it for almost 120 years, except for last year when, obviously, we couldn't do it for various reasons. At the different entrances of the church, you will see these uh, bonfire praise sticks, which is a better name than a tongue depressor. <laughs> but the purpose of these is to get one Write your favorite verse on the, on the stick, something you're thankful for, something you want to praise God for, and then join us Thursday morning at 7 for a great time of praise and worship. It's one of my favorite services of the year. And uh, so we'd invite you to join us. We also have a significant event, one of our more significant outreaches of the year, coming up in uh, three weeks. And my wife Carol is going to come tell us more about that. Good morning. Um, Women's Ministry is inviting ladies 12 and older to our annual Women Ladies Christmas um, event. This year we will be hosting a tea luncheon instead of an evening event. It will be on Saturday, December 11th at 11 a.m. The theme for this year is Glory to the Newborn King, as we remember that Jesus first came into our world as a baby to become our Savior. In remembrance of his coming, this year we are encouraging those that attend to bring a donation for the Springs, Springfield Care Pregnancy Care Center. Um, and as um, the newsletter has had in it the last few weeks, and if you've seen these cards around, on the back side is the list of the things that the care center could greatly use. So we're just asking you that in addition to purchasing a ticket, that you also bring a donation for that ministry. Um, this year our event will be different. Usually we're a little more formal, it's, a, it's an evening type event, but we're going to be a little more casual this year. And we will start our time off by having a good hour or so where we can do some gift making, some do-it-yourself gifting, and also we'll have a seminar on the history of some of the Christmas carols that, that we sing. We'll enjoy a tea luncheon, um, more time of singing Christmas carols, and we'll be hearing from Lo Lois Darcy as she shares her heart with us. Today and for the next two weeks, sign-ups start in the back of the sanctuary after the morning worship service. And you may also register and pay via online through Breeze. This is a wonderful time um, to invite your non-Christians family members, friends, to come and join us for just a time of remembering that Christmas is a time of celebrating Christ and what he came to bring and give to us. And so I hope and pray that you will join us this year. Thank you. Let's pray together as we begin our time of worship this morning. Father, thank you so much that we can gather in your presence to worship you, to exalt you, to sing your praise, to declare your glory here in Chicopee and around the world. Father, we pray that all that we do and say might please you and honor you today in the name of Jesus. Amen. Every heartbeat tells your glory, every breath declares your name. I will shout it from the mountain, not a shame, not a shame. Till the day my heart not beating, I will live in pregnant love. Till I Oh 
love you, and we sing your praises this morning. Lord, we marvel that the God of the universe would love us enough that you sent Jesus, would love us enough that when we were sinners, when we rebelled against you, you found a way to save us. You, you, oh, Lord, it's just words cannot describe how amazing that thought is, that we don't deserve your love, that we don't deserve your mercy, we don't deserve your grace, but you pour it out on us so greatly. Lord, we're so thankful this morning. Lord, we pray that our hearts would be open, that we would remove ourselves from getting in the way, that we would hear from you this morning, that your spirit would speak through your servant and the ears and eyes of our hearts would be wide open to hear from you. We pray these things in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team. As you uh, come in the building and the different entrances of the building, you'll see a yellow bookmark that gives the where we're headed over the next uh, three months in our uh, sermons on Sunday morning. Uh, beginning uh, next Sunday, we're going to start a, a series on Advent. And uh, this year we're going to be in the book of Isaiah, looking at Isaiah's prophecies about the Messiah. And so over the next uh, five weeks, we'll be in Isaiah looking at those. Then in January, we're going to revisit our vision for the church. Last year in January, we introduced a kind of an expanded version of our vision statement using our initials FCBC and what it means to be faithfully following Christ-centered, Bible-believing, and a caring community. And so each Sunday in January, we'll be looking at a different passage that helps us to better understand what type of church we want to be, who we want to be, what we want to do. And then in uh, February, we'll come back to our study of the Gospel of John. So today we're going to finish the prologue, the introduction to the book, and then we'll come back in uh, January and uh, continue on uh, with the series. And so it's actually fitting this morning that even though next week we begin Advent, the passage we're going to look at today looks at the Incarnation. So let's pray together as we come to God's Word this morning. Father, thank you for the opportunity that we have to gather together to worship you, to exalt you, to praise you. Father, I pray that we would better understand what took place when you sent your son to earth to be born as a child, to grow up as a man, and to die for the sins of the world. Father, help us to have a greater confidence in your word, a greater confidence in your promises, that we would be more obedient, that we would be more bold in sharing the message of the gospel with those that we come in contact with. So we commit all of this to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Over the centuries, the last 2,000 years, there's been the question about who is Jesus? Is he God? Is he simply a man? Is he both? In the early years of the church, in the 100s, the 200s, the pendulum swang to the point where people denied Jesus' humanity. There was a, a philosophy known as docetism that said he merely appeared to be a man. He, he wasn't really a man. He didn't really have a body. He just looked like a man. I don't know if that's like a first century hologram or, or what you do with that, but they denied that Jesus was a real person. Today, the, the pendulum probably swings the other direction where people deny his deity. And they say, well, he was a good teacher, he taught great things, but God? 
you know, that's just not possible. And every world religion errs on this question of who is Jesus. Hindus believe that Jesus was merely one of the many appearances of the god Vishnu. And Jesus was just a teacher. He was a guru. He was an avatar. Buddhists believe he was a teacher and a philosopher. And since they don't believe in God, he can't be the son of God. The Baha'i religion says he's just one of the many manifestations of God. The New Age movement says he's a spiritual model. He's a guru. He's now an ascended master. Islam believes that Jesus was the son of Mary and a prophet. And before he was to be killed, Allah took him to heaven, and someone else, maybe Judas Iscariot, died in his place. Mormons believe that Jesus was conceived by God and Mary, and he was a man who became a God, and he's the elder brother of Satan. Jehovah's Witnesses says that he was a created being who became the Messiah at his baptism. And when he died, he didn't die on a cross, he died on a torture stake. And his body was destroyed and only his spirit was resurrected. Christian science, which some say is neither Christian nor science, says that Jesus was a man who displayed the Christ idea. The Unity Church has a similar idea, saying he was a man who had the Christ consciousness, the idea of a perfect man. In the passage we're going to look at this morning, the Apostle John presents the the idea and the fact that in the incarnation, when Jesus was born, Jesus, the eternal Son of God, took on human flesh and became a man. In the incarnation, God became man, and he was fully God and fully man. So turn with me this morning to the Gospel of John. We're looking at, we're in the first chapter, and as I said, we're finishing the prologue, which is the first 18 verses of the book, and we're focusing on verses 14 to 18 this morning. So listen as I read from the English Standard Version, and then we'll come back and begin to unpack this passage. John 1, verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. In the first 18 verses, what we've seen so far and what we're going to see this morning is John presents several facts about the Word, which in this passage he identifies as Jesus. Starts out in verse 1 where he presents the idea that the Word, Jesus, is co-equal and co-eternal with God the Father. Both of them existed before time began, and they were equal. They were both God. As John says in verse 1, Jesus, the Word, is the creator of the universe. Verse 3, everything was created by him and nothing was created that wasn't created by him, which covers the gamut of everything. In verse 4, he's described as the source of life and the source of light. In verse 14, we're going to see this morning is that The Word is God in human flesh, fully God, fully man. And in verse 14 and 18, Jesus reveals God to the world. If you want to know what God is like, study the Gospels, study Jesus, because Jesus revealed the Father to the world. 
That's what John is saying. So the first thing we see in verse 14 is that in the incarnation, God became man. God became flesh. Where he says, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. Glory as of the only son from the father, full of grace and truth. What John is doing is he's, in verse 14, he's going back to verse 1. And he's tying it together using the name of Jesus as the word. Where in verse 1 he says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God. Or the word, the word was with God. It's that they're co-eternal. They're both from the beginning before time ever began. Neither one had a beginning nor an end. They're co-eternal. And the word was God. So they're co-equal. There's not a hierarchy. There's, they're equal. They're both God. And now in verse 14, he says, and the word became flesh. And dwelt among us. So it's God in human flesh. Jesus was co-eternal, co-equal with the Father. And took on human form, took on human flesh. And lived on planet earth. John uses four words to describe one of the most significant doctrines of scripture. The incarnation. This is the most concise statement about the incarnation in the Bible. You go to the book of Philippians, Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul uses seven verses to describe the same idea. John does it in four words. The word became flesh. Now think about that statement. Think about the implications of that statement. The infinite became finite. Eternal entered time. The invisible became visible. The creator entered his creation. John uses four words. They're simple to read, but they are so complex in what it describes. How God became man. The word became flesh. And there's significance to the words that John uses here. He doesn't say the word became a man, the word took on human form. He says the word became flesh because it describes he didn't just take on human nature, but he took on a human body. And God became a man. He became a real, live, living person. Now, As John is writing his gospel in around 90 AD, as I said, there was the philosophy of docetism that said he's just, he appeared to be a man. And what John is doing throughout the gospel is demonstrating that Jesus experienced everything that people do. As we'll see when we get to chapter 4, the story of the woman at the well, Jesus is weary. He's thirsty from a, a long journey. When you get to chapter 11 and the death of his good friend Lazarus, he experienced deep emotions. He groans because he is so sorrowful because of his friend's death. He wept as he stands before the tomb. When you get to chapter 19 where it describes the death of Jesus on the cross, he thirsted, he died, he bled. When you get to chapter 20, we'll, we'll, we'll see the details of the resurrection. He has a body that can be touched. He has a body that can eat fish. And what John is trying to present is that Jesus was a real life person, but he was God in human flesh. He was God in a, in a, in a body. He says that, The word became flesh and dwelt among us. The word dwelt literally means to pitch a tent, to put up a tabernacle. And the words that John is using, in essence, point back to the Old Testament. And the picture of the worship center, the tabernacle in the the 
wilderness when Israel was traveling through the wilderness on their way to the promised land. And just as God took up residence in the tabernacle in the wilderness, so Jesus took up residence on planet Earth. And there's that picture of, of he pitched a tent, a, a, a body that he lived in, and he dwelt among us. He took up residence on planet Earth. John says, I was an eyewitness of this. It says he dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Then again, John just is using simple words, very few words, to say that I'm an eyewitness. If you get to 1 John, the letter that John wrote, John expands on what it meant to be an eyewitness, where in 1 John 1, 1, he said that which is from the beginning, speaking of, of Jesus, of the word, we've seen with our eyes, we've looked upon, we've touched with our hands concerning the word of life. So what John is saying is, I was an eyewitness. I saw him, I looked at him, and I touched him. I, I was there. I was present. I can testify this is God in human flesh. He says we've seen his glory. Very possible that what John is referring to in this statement is that experience on the Mount of Transfiguration, where Peter, James, and John went with Jesus and Jesus, in essence, pulled back the corner of his deity and they caught a glimpse of his glory before time ever began. What's ironic about that is John doesn't include that event in his gospel. You read about it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But John doesn't talk about the transfiguration, even though he says, we've seen his glory which there's a little bit of irony and humility on John's part, saying, I saw it, but I can't even describe that I was there. And John leaves that out of his gospel, which is kind of an interesting statement alone. He says, we've seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father. Some translations have the the phrase, only begotten of the Father, which in English sounds like there was a beginning, that he was born. But what it means is that he's completely unique. He's one of a kind. He's a one and only. He's the only son, the completely unique son of the Father. And what this shows is that there is no room in Christianity for syncretism. It's not Jesus plus worship of ancestors. It's not Jesus plus good philosophy. It's not Jesus plus good works. It's not Jesus plus giving a million dollars to the church. He's the completely unique son of the Father, God in human flesh. And again, what John is doing is he's using very few words to describe a very complex idea, a complex doctrine of how God became man. He says that we've seen him, we've seen his glory. Glory is the only son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace is the idea of graciousness or goodness. Truth is the idea of integrity and truthfulness, and they're all bound up in one person. Just as the Father was gracious, just as the Father was truth, so Jesus expresses that, reveals that aspect of God to us. That as we see Jesus, we see the idea of grace and truth that the Father expresses. Now it goes on, as, we, as we've talked about in the first chapter, what the Apostle John is doing is he's alternating back and forth between Jesus and John the Baptist, and Jesus and John the Baptist, and Jesus and John the Baptist. And he's doing that in this section as well, where in verse 15 he switches to John, meaning John the Baptist, 
bore witness about him, about Jesus, and cried out, This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me, ranks before me because he was before me. Well, what's it, what John the Baptist is saying is that John the Baptist and Jesus were cousins. You can read about their relationship in the early chapters of Matthew. John the Baptist was six months older than Jesus. And in that culture, if you're older, you should have prominence. You should be greater than your younger cousin. But what John the Baptist recognized is, okay, I may be six months older physically, but Jesus is so much older because he had no beginning. He's, he existed long before me. And John the Baptist recognized that his role, as we saw last week, was to shine a light on Jesus, to point people to Jesus. When we come back to the rest of chapter 1 in February, we'll see more about that in John the Baptist's ministry. But John said, I'm here to tell people about Jesus and to point people to him. As we talked about last week, John the Baptist is the first of many witnesses that we'll see in John's gospel talking about who Jesus is. Verses 16 and 17 present the idea that all of the resources of God are present in Jesus. It says, for from him, for from his fullness, we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. The phrase grace upon grace can be understood in three different ways from these two verses. One is the idea of grace upon grace, the picture of an ocean wave followed by another ocean wave, followed by another ocean wave, followed by another ocean wave. It's the idea of God pours out grace upon grace upon grace upon grace. And Jesus brought God's grace as an ocean brings water to the shore. There's one grace after another, after another, and there's no end of it. As the prophet Jeremiah said, his grace is new every morning. The second way you can take it is the idea of grace followed by a different grace, meeting the challenge of the day. That God gives grace, but it's a little bit different form, a little bit different flavor, depending on what you're facing today. Maybe when you get home this afternoon, you face a, a family issue, a, a broken relationship, and you need a certain type of grace to deal with that. And maybe tomorrow it's a, a financial challenge. And you need a different type of grace to meet that need. And maybe later in this week, it's a health issue. Maybe you're waiting for a call from the doctor about some tests that are coming. And you need a different type of grace to face that. And it's the idea that Jesus brings grace upon grace to meet the need of the moment, to meet the challenge of the day. Another way you can understand the phrase is rather than grace upon grace, the middle word can also be translated instead, grace instead of grace. And that's where it ties into verse 17, talking about Moses. The idea that the grace Jesus brings is different and better and supersedes the grace that Moses brought. Now, oftentimes when we think about law and grace, we draw a dark black line between law and grace. And what we forget is that there was grace in law, and there's also rules in grace. And what John is saying is that the grace that Jesus brings is better than the grace that Moses brought, that it supersedes it, because it finally deals with the sin question. And in reality, I think you can combine all three with the idea that the grace that Jesus brings is better 
than the grace that Moses brought, and it meets the needs and the challenges of each day. And God continually pours out grace upon grace upon grace. It's better than the grace that came before. It'll meet the challenge and the need of today. And it's a never-ending supply, if you will, of the grace that, that, he, that he brings, that he offers. In verse 18, we see the idea that Jesus is the exclusive explanation of the Father. That no one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. In the Old Testament, God did not appear as himself. There's different manifestations of God, if you will. Maybe God appeared in a vision. He appeared in what's referred to as a theophany, a, a, a person who came who was the pre-incarnate Christ. Maybe there was a, an anthropomorphic expression of God. So you go back to the book of Genesis when God comes to Abraham. He comes in the form of three men, three visitors that come. And we later learn in that story that one of them is the pre-incarnate Christ who comes to speak with Abraham. In Exodus chapter 3, God speaks to Moses through a burning bush. As we saw during our study of the prophet Elijah, God spoke to Elijah through a still, small voice on a mountain. In the book of Daniel, a hand writes on a wall to tell about the coming destruction of Babylon. So God didn't appear in physical form in the Old Testament. There was different representations of of God. But God did appear in Jesus Christ, and he revealed the Father to us. So when we read about the miracles that Jesus performed, what we see is the compassionate heart of God the Father, and his compassion that he cares for people, that he meets their needs. When Jesus cleanses the temple and drives out the money changers, we see God's zeal and passion for worship, for prayer. When we see Jesus spending time with children, we see God's heart for the least and the lost, those whom society says are not that, not all that important. But Jesus demonstrates the character and the heart of God. And as we study the Gospels, as we study this book, we're going to see more about God because of how Jesus reveals God to us. That through his teaching, through his actions, through his prayers, we get a deeper and a broader and a bigger view of who God is. That Jesus, who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. He's revealed God to us. So what jo John is doing is he's, he's ending his prologue in the same way that he began it. In verses 1 and 2, he said, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God. Now in 14 to 18, he says, The Word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we've seen his glory. Glory is the only begotten of the Father, the only Son of the Father. The Word was with God, verses 1 and 2. And in 18, the only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. What John is doing just in the prologue is giving us a glimpse that the incarnation leads to salvation. The manger sits in the shadow of the cross. Jesus 
came as a baby. He took on human flesh. He became a man, born as a child, grew up as a man to die for the sins of the world. He's the one who is the full and final sacrifice for sin. As you think about this passage and these verses, even the first 18 verses in reality, I encourage you to grow deeper in your knowledge and your love for God. Don't just walk away saying, hey, I know more. While that's important, let that knowledge transform you. Develop a deeper love for the God who cares, the God who speaks, the God who sent his son to meet our needs. And then tell others about the grace upon grace upon grace that you've received, that you've experienced. Think about who you can invite to church over the next several weeks as we move into this season of the incarnation and we focus on Jesus Christ. Think about who you can invite to the the women's tea to share the gospel and to experience that. Think about who you can share the message of hope with among your family, your friends, your coworkers, your schoolmates. But take what you've learned and share that with others. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus to be our Savior. Thank you so much that you didn't just create a world and leave it to run on its own, but that you entered time, you entered your own creation, that you sent your Son to take on human flesh and become a man. Father, cause us to grow deeper in our knowledge of you. Cause us to grow more in love with you. Father, give us opportunities to share that message and give us a boldness to tell others about you. And so, Father, we commit all this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen. This week, let me encourage you to celebrate the Son. Have a great week.